should note that the term competent person appears in the very first paragraph of the general requirements found in section 1926.1203. Paragraph A requires that all employers have a designated competent person identify all confined spaces in which one or more of the employees they direct may perform work. This includes temporary service employees. Then the competent person must identify each space that meets the definition of a permit required confined space based on their evaluation of the space and any necessary test. So this is essentially a two-step process. Step one, identify all confined spaces at the job site and then step two, determine which, if any, of those confined spaces meet the definition of a permit required confined space and conversely which ones do not. The OSHA definition of a confined space can be found in 1926.1202 definitions. There you will find a confined space is characterized by three criteria. Be mindful that all three criteria must be in place to meet the OSHA definition. Also, keep in mind that whether or not a hazard is present inside the space is not relevant at this point. You are only trying to identify the confined spaces at your job site. The first criteria listed in OSHA's definition of a confined space is that the space is large enough and so configured that an employee can bodily enter and perform assigned work. The operative term is bodily enter. That means the employee can fit entirely inside the space. If the space is not large enough or configured to where it can be bodily entered, then it does not meet the definition of a confined space. This standard is only intended to apply to spaces large enough and configured so that the entire body of an employee can enter. The second criteria listed in OSHA's definition of a confined space is that the space has a limited or restricted means for entry or exit. Contrary to popular belief, this does not mean that the space has only one way in or out. According to the definition in 1926.1202, limited or restricted means for entry or exit means a condition that has a potential to impede an employee's movement into or out of a confined space. That definition goes on to explain that examples of a limited means of entry or exit include, but are not limited to, trip hazards, poor illumination, slippery floors, inclining surfaces, and ladders. The OSHA Confined Space Advisor also states that limited or restricted means for entry or exit exist where the occupant must crawl, climb, twist, be constrained in a narrow opening, follow a lengthy path, or otherwise exert unusual effort to enter or leave, or where the entrance may become sealed or secured against opening from inside. Here are a few examples of where a limited or restricted means of entry or exit exists. Portals, such as this one, where the entrant must squeeze through to enter or exit the space horizontally, as well as where entry is made vertically. Hatches of a size or location requiring the entrant to climb or squeeze through. Manholes that the entrant must pass through to get into or out of the space and entryways where the worker must climb onto a ladder to enter or exit the space. Additional examples of a limited or restricted means of entry or exit include spiral staircases which can be difficult to climb or descend, steep stairways such as ship ladders and other non-standard stairways, tight crawl spaces such as beneath equipment, under floors, between walls and above some ceilings, and spaces such as long tunnels where the workers must travel a long distance to get to the nearest means of exit. The question often arises as to whether or not OSHA considers a standard sized doorway to be a limited or restricted means of entry or exit. This topic is not directly addressed in the OSHA Confined Spaces for Construction Standard. 
However, in the preamble to the 1910 General Industry Permit Required Confined Spaces Standard, OSHA states that doorways and other portals through which a person can walk are not to be considered unlimited means of entry or exit. However, a space containing such a door or portal may still be deemed a confined space if an entrance ability to escape from inside the space in an emergency would be hindered. OSHA further clarifies their position in a later amendment to the 1910 standard published in the Federal Register where they state that even if the door or portal of a space is of sufficient size, obstructions could make entry into or exit from the space difficult. The agency intended that spaces which otherwise meet the definition of confined spaces and which have obstructed entry or exits even though the portal is a standard sized doorway, be classified as confined spaces. In other words, a space with a standard doorway would be considered to have a limited means of entry or exit if, inside that space, there are pipes, ductwork, equipment, or other obstructions that would make it difficult for a worker to escape in the case of an emergency. One more thing to keep in mind is that a structure under construction may not have a limited means of entry or exit initially, but it may become limited at a later point during construction. For example, employees can easily walk into and out of this large steel storage tank under construction because some of the large steel panels were left out at ground level. Therefore, no means of restricted entry or exit exists at this time. However, once the lower panels are all installed and employees must enter and exit through a portal or through the top, then a limited means of entry or exit would exist. The third and final criteria listed in OSHA's definition for a confined space is that the space is not designed for continuous employee occupancy. For example, this particular utility vault has not been designed and outfitted with any safeguards to control a potentially hazardous atmosphere, nor are there any lights installed inside this vault. So at a minimum, workers must utilize a portable blower, auxiliary lighting, and a portable gas detector when entering this space. On the other hand, this particular utility vault has been engineered and constructed with the built-in ventilation system, lighting system, and gas detection system. Because it has been designed for employee occupancy and those protective measures remain in place during entry, this particular utility vault would not be considered a confined space under the OSHA standard. Here is a recap of the three criteria listed in OSHA's definition of a confined space. Number one, the space is large enough and configured that an employee can bodily enter and perform assigned work. And, number two, the space has limited or restricted means of entry or exit. And, number three, the space has not been designed for continuous employee occupancy. As a reminder, all three criteria must be present for the space to be considered a confined space. In a moment, we will look at some examples of confined spaces. However, keep in mind that while these are examples of confined spaces, they may or may not be permit required confined spaces. That will be determined at a later time. Tanks built on top of the ground would be considered confined spaces once they are constructed to the point where they must be entered through a portal or other small opening on the side or the top as is this elevated water tank which is entered vertically through a portal on top. Silos that are entered through a manway or hatch on the top, side, or bottom could be considered a confined space as are similarly constructed storage bins. One commonly overlooked confined space is air handlers such as this where the worker enters through an access panel and climbs inside to perform work. Other examples of confined spaces include ductwork large enough for a worker to bodily enter through an access panel or hatch, 
or where the worker enters an open end and travels into the duct. Some smokestacks and chimneys would be considered confined spaces when the worker must enter through a hatch or other restricted means of entry, and escalator pits that are large enough for the worker to bodily enter and are deep enough to make it difficult to exit would be considered confined spaces mobile or fixed equipment that can be bodily entered and has a restricted means of entry or exit like this mixer on a concrete truck are considered a confined space. In addition, large boilers that are configured to be bodily entered through a restricted means of entry or exit are also considered confined spaces. And large furnaces and related equipment which are constructed in certain configurations that can make them hard to get into and out of could also be considered confined spaces. Tanks that are affixed to trucks or trailers and which are entered through a hatch or portal are considered a confined space as are some crawl spaces located beneath equipment, floors, walls, and above some ceilings. Sanitary sewers that are large enough to be bodily entered are confined spaces as are many related facilities like digesters and some sewer lift stations. Also, storm sewers and drainage culverts that are large enough to be bodily entered and have a restricted means of entry or exit are considered confined spaces. Another example of a confined space is this septic tank which is large enough for a worker to enter and has a restricted means of entry and exit. As discussed earlier, most underground utility vaults that have not been designed for continuous occupancy are typically considered a confined space, as would be most pipelines that are large enough to be bodily entered and have a restricted means of entry or exit, such as a portal, manway, or an opened end small enough to require the worker to crawl or stoop to enter. Even in situations where a large bore pipeline has an open end and the worker can enter upright, the pipe would still be considered a confined space if the worker must walk a long distance into the pipe to where a restricted means of exit exists. Some large dock levelers are designed with a front cover or top that opens enough to allow a worker to crawl inside the pit beneath the equipment. These would be considered a confined space. Utility tunnels that have pipes, ducts, or similar obstructions that require the entrant to crawl under or over them would be considered a confined space as would a long utility tunnel that requires the entrant to travel a great distance to get to the nearest exit. And some attic spaces that require the worker to climb a ladder and squeeze through an opening to get inside are confined spaces too. Open top pits that are deep enough to require the worker to enter or exit by a ladder or are too deep for the worker to easily step out of would be considered a confined space. Conveyor tunnels, such as this one, that are large enough to be bodily entered would be considered a confined space too. And many elevator shafts and pits are confined spaces when they are deep enough or otherwise configured to require the worker to enter and exit on a ladder or other restricted means of entry or exit exist. These are but a few examples of confined spaces and there are many others that are not mentioned here. So take a few moments to think about it and then write down all of the confined spaces in your workplace. We have now covered step one, learning to identify confined spaces. We will now focus on how to determine if a confined space meets the OSHA definition of a permit required confined space. Why make the distinction between permit and non-permit confined spaces? If a space is classified as a permit required confined space, entry is only allowed under a confined space entry program meeting all of the requirements of OSHA's confined space standard. However, confined spaces that do not meet the OSHA definition of a permit space, which are known as non-permit required confined spaces, may be entered without following all these precautions. 